I need the funny business, otherwise I won't come out on the film and all the guests are not a copy. Um, because it's much closer to you than it is to me. If you're in here for the film, try and get down to the National Museum of Computing in Bletchley, which is about 40 miles north of London. It's at the risk of sounding like Chessington's in the world of adventure. It's a magical place. Actually, it binds together 118, 119, 117 very nicely because it, the things that happened there happened, or the things that, when it was actually not a museum, it happened there when there wasn't such a big differentiation between analog and digital electronics and computer science wasn't really appealed in its own right. And we tend to compartmentalise things, especially by making them take down to them, which you think about separately. And actually, if you're a practicing engineer, Everything comes into consideration all the time for the judgments you have to make. So it's a good way to go down there and see what's not how it used to be as such, because it still is that way. But we tend not to think about it like that too much anymore. Right, I overran last time, so we've got to talk about Chucky Dives for a minute or two. But I'm convinced it won't take long. We said that we had a PM diode and the P and the N are both conductor and often times the silicon. And if they are, it would have 0.7 volts across it when we had it turned on. And some current was flowing. We also said that there are other kinds of diodes, and I suggested that one might be made from a mechanism of a semiconductor. When we do that, we can adjust the turn on voltage, and we can adjust how quickly electrons and holes recombine when we want to switch off, and how quickly we can turn on the diode as well by producing free of carriers in the transition region. And John Heffer will discuss this with you at some length, and then next year John Davies and I will discuss it again at even more length. But for now, I will just say that the construction is similar to the PM device, but the circuit characteristics are different. Usually they have a lower turn on voltage, it's often between about 0.2 and 0.6 volts. And the Shockley diode will only use one kind of semiconductor, so it will be metal and N or metal and P. We use them in situations where we don't use a PM diode, so oftentimes in radio frequency circuits, um, in motor drive circuits as well, anytime when you don't want to dissipate too much power, because your power is your I times your V, if your V is lower, your power should be lower than it would be if it was a PN diode. So a high efficiency application as well. They also, because the metal has many, many free carriers available, they can recombine with whatever carrier the semiconductor is, be it NLP or be it NLP. <coughs> So you can have really fast switch off, so sometimes we want to use them to save other components, so for clamp injection, that sort of thing. If you want to go on Wikipedia, it's shot key, not shot knee. Remember, shot, shot key, inventor of diode and transistor, then a maniac believes in eugenics. Yeah? 1989 he died. Brought a shot key, first describer of uh, fluctuations and noise, um, and shot key diode, uh, 1976. Right, that was that. I'm not going to review it because we did it before. There's my mate. <coughs> so this is today's lecture. So last time we met, we spent a lot of our discussion on dealing with the diode conduction state example. And if you are looking through the problem sheets, you will find that problem sheet number two, which is the diode conduction state, will relate to the last couple of lectures. If you're still on the background of skills and you're wondering whether how to deal with capacitive graphs, then it's in lecture one and the start of lecture two. What week is it? Eight. Eight. So you've got homework from me during week nine. Is that what it says? It says it on the front of the homework, which is like third or fourth thing in the pack. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, right up there. Good. So this is my way of telling you I've covered this stuff in quotes. So there is there is no chance that you can say, but you didn't do it. I did. And if you didn't see it, it's in the videos. Um, the videos which are on the website, and the website is on the front of the handout. And if you don't have the handout, you can go to the, the office and get it, but by now I think you probably will have it. 
Once we finished our diode conduction state example, we also talked about light emitting diode, and we did some calculation involved in determining what current should flow and how much light based on a, an example that I pulled off the internet. <coughs> And then we went on to talk about the Zener diode and a little bit about the Zener effect and we got rather bogged down in tunneling for a bit. Tunneling will be covered again by John David in 65 and possibly a little bit by John Heffernan in the other half of this module. Um, we will talk about Zener diodes towards the end of this semester when we deal with power supply circuits. So for now you just need to know they exist, that's all. And just now I talked about Chucky diode a bit. Today I want to talk mostly about pulse circuits. So this is material which you cannot find in the videos, which is why I'm videoing it, because soon you will be able to find it in the videos, and you can get it relined. In the past, I have, so a lot of this stuff's in 117, which is becoming a bit of a thing for me, because there is quite a lot of overlap. But I have been allowing students to take the 117 the wrong way and just smoosh them together on their own. And it hasn't worked out so well because I marked last year's exam and this bit everybody fell to pieces on. So I've decided that I want to present it to you as an individual thing so you can internalise it maybe. If you're interested in the practice for this, the next homework, so homework two, and problem sheet number three will be about this material. So today, pulse circuits with resistors and capacitors. So you've done some pulse circuits in 117? No. Excellent. It's good to know the degrees are planned well. Well, you will. Um, <coughs> so we will talk about some 117 type pulse circuit, which you will see uh, at some point in the future. And then we will talk about some pulse circuits with diodes in. Um, and then I'll introduce some circuits which use AC currents um, rather than pulses. So you, you would want to use this sort of circuit in a measurement system any time you need to do timing. So if I said to you, think about your TV, old style TV, are you familiar with interlacing? Or if you're not, then 1050p, 1050i, the i is for interlacing. So the, there is, in the old system, a beam of electrons shot towards a phosphor screen, and it takes that bit, that bit, that bit, that bit, it goes down in two halves and hardly interlaced, like the mesh on the top. <coughs> to decide when the beam should move to the edge of the screen and hang the next line, you have a horizontal trigger. And the horizontal trigger is a pulse circuit. Now, in an LCD system, we don't have to deal with that anymore. But there are still quite a lot of CRCs in the world, even if we don't use them for TVs. There are many other applications besides. For example, clock distribution in a large digital IC, you want to put pulses all around the place, and they have to go quite a long way, through copper wires that have capacitance to ground. So you're putting pulses through things which are resistive that see capacitance. It's essentially a pulse circuit. Similarly, in a radar system, I send out a lot of energy, it bounces off the enemy, and I receive a tiny amount of it, a certain time later, and that time is important because it tells me how far away and how high I'm touch. So they turn up all over the place. Luckily for you, I'm limiting it to just RC circuits, and just with diodes. So I'm not going to expect you to learn 150 years of electronics and make it all go. We will only use the result. So in 117, you will come across a derivation for why capacitors charged through resistors have exponential shapes. I'm just going to take the exponential and use it. I'm not expecting derivation. The key thing about first order RC circuits these are resistor and capacitor. When we talk about transient or time domain response, as opposed to frequency domain, is that there will be an exponential involved. And there is also something called a time constant. And the time constant is related to the values of the components. That's to say how many ohms in resistor, how many farads in capacitor. It's not to do with the size of the signal or its shape. It's fundamental to the circuit itself. Time constant is unsurprisingly measured in seconds. And usually, for the very simple case which we will do in a minute, is R times C. So if it's R times C and it comes out to seconds, then we can say, well, R is V upon I, which is Ohm's law, and Q equals C times V. No. I got three yeses, so it must have been. It's like alien life. First set of aliens that we discover will be very interesting, but it doesn't mean anything. Second set, aliens are everywhere. 
all through the universe. One is special, two is there are many. So, Q is C times V. If we rearrange for C, we get Q upon V, which is Coulombs over volts. If you work it through your component, it comes out to seconds. It's not quite proof, but it's good enough for an engineer. Happy with this? So this is the sort of thing that I would expect you would come up against in 117. It's a pulse circuit with just a resistor and a capacitor. And we have some rather long, nasty looking equations, but don't panic. My blue, no, blue line is my input, so it's going to be a square. And if I was to write this out as a question, I would say a square pulse of height uh, V1 minus V2 of length 5 seconds. And in your head, you see the graph. Yeah. Getting to, there's not necessarily going to be a graph. And I'm not saying that I may or may not give you a graph in the exam. What I'm really saying is, some problems you will come up against, you won't have it written out for you. You'll have to be able to figure out what's going on. So my result will be green one, which is the exponential followed by another exponential. The reason it's exponential, does anybody want to have a go? It's fairly important we can pin this down. Right. Are you happy with the idea of charge flowing in the circuit, or shall I use water and buckets? We'll go with charge, and if it doesn't work out well, we'll go for water and buckets. So, in the beginning, the capacitor is not charged up at all, so it's empty. If the capacitor is empty, there can be no electric field inside it, because there is no charge on its plates to create the electric field. If there's no electric field inside it, it can't have any voltage across it. So when I say it's empty, I mean no voltage here. If there's no voltage here, and it's ready to accept some charge, we can put charge into it easily, it looks like a short circuit because when we try to put current, it will flow easily. When we try to put current in a short circuit, it flows easily. So R2 appears to be entirely across VI. So my current into the capacitor at this, at this point here, just when we start the pulse, will be V1 divided by R2. And that's the biggest that current will ever be. As we start to put the charge into the capacitor, this plate becomes all charged up compared to this one, an electric field develops, the voltage is produced. <coughs> v in minus V out is what lives across R2, which must be less than V in, because V out is increasing positively. As a consequence, the current IC1, which flows in this loop, must be decreasing. Since the current is decreasing, the capacitor is now charging up more slowly than it was just now, just before, when I started. And the further I take this, the more charged up this gets, the less voltage R gets, the lower C becomes, so the slower it charges. But it does still charge. And as it charges up more, the voltage across R2 becomes even less and the current becomes less, and eventually we reach a situation where it's charging very, very slowly, but it's almost reached the aiming voltage, which in this case is V1 minus V2, it's the height of the pulse. Satisfied with that, or do you want it again? I've got two happy, one unhappy, three happy, and a lot of abstainers. You know how democracy works, right? Good. If you don't fancy that, go home, fill your sink up, and pull the plug out, and then mark off, count in seconds and mark, and then look at the height of the water and the distances it went, more in the first than in the last, for the same reasons. The amount of water pushing down on the plug holes, the pressure, and that's like the volts. You know, the, the resistance is kind of the width of the pipe, and after that it all gets a bit funny. I prefer not to think about it like that because in a few years' time, you will have to do some courses where people say, oh, voltages on wires are not always the same, and they travel. But if you've been listening to me and you're on, on the money, you'll know that voltages go across things, and they're always the same. But that's secretly a little lie. And I don't want to go into water and pipes because that doesn't work forever. It only works for now. So if you have to, it's fine. Yes? So is this kind of like um, DC transients for the exponential growth in the cake? Yes, it is entirely that. If we said this pulse, ah, sorry, if we said this pulse goes forever, then it is a DC problem just here. 
So which course is that in? Uh, that was in my VTEC. In your VTEC? Right, okay. Well, that <coughs> means other than six or seven of you, you may not have seen it yet, but it will come up. So, to get through the equations briefly, I'm just going to state these. You can learn them if you wish, but you will come to realise the shape is given by the exponential bit. So I've got a thing that deals with the height. I can call it A if you like, the, the height there, if you want to call it one thing. And then I have 1 minus e to the minus t over tau. t is my time, but in this graph, I made it in time constants, so that this graph does not represent any particular example. It's a representation that tells you after five time constants, whatever that number may actually turn out to be, it will be mostly charged up. And that holds forever. Five time constants is about 99.6% charged up. Or five time constants is 99.6% discharged. Then we have the offset, B2. Usually I'll make this zero, because otherwise the question is a bit unkind. But you may come across a situation in practice where it's not zero. So don't forget that it might not be, even though it probably is. Do you feel confident with this? If you don't, the best thing to do is sit down with the numbers. So imagine a T in the tower. Make tower one, because it makes life easy. And then make, I don't know, V11, V20, put some numbers in, and then advance T, working it out as you go, do like five or six, maybe even ten sets of numbers, and it will show you that this is the, the shape you get when you apply it out. Similarly for this one, exponential decay. By the time we get to June, these will be in your head, and not through my fault. Through the fault of uh, Chris Gould, who's in 117. So, what should we say about pulse circuits? Well, often we will put in several capacitances because the circuits are realistic when they're a bit larger. The circuits I have here are just to demonstrate some um, facts, if you like, about circuit theory. Although, I think facts are like nails because they're the things that I give you which are unmovable, which certainly will change in your career at some point. If I stand up and say, they will never make a good memory stuff. It's a kind of device that doesn't exist yet. But it may happen. And if I let loose a generation of engineers that say, there will never be a good memory stuff, none of you will ever invent a good memory stuff. Because I already told you it's impossible, and you believe me. So I can prove the things that are in these slides. It doesn't mean you should take them as facts. Although if you want to, you can just remember. It's OK. So often many capacitances, because circuits are quite large and distributed sometimes, especially in the, the clock distribution example. Some places they are stray, that's to say the things we don't want, things that don't appear on our circuit diagrams. They're the things that often catch you out. Only when you get in the laboratory can you realise there are some things that aren't on the circuit diagrams. Oftentimes, if the circuit is big, it's taxing. That's to say the equations get bigger as well. And we quite like to be able to reduce our circuits to something that's quite tractable. Otherwise, we will use a computer to solve it. Of course, it will only solve it numerically. There is an excellent example of a pulse circuit, which is a 10 to 1 oscilloscope probe, which you're all familiar with because you did Workstation 1. You remember that, or have you blocked it out? <coughs> and you tweak, you tweak the the little yellow turny thing on the probe body, and it adjusts the flatness. This makes sense? So you, you know that you were tweaking the capacitor there. Yes? No. No. Oh, you were. Ah, you've already tuned in, you didn't even know it. Yes, there's a little capacitor inside. If you go on Wikipedia, 10 to 1 oscilloscope probe, you can see the circuit. It's just two resistors, two capacitors. One of them is tunable. So this, actually, there is a laboratory in the second year, which I run which is the amplifier laboratory, and we will go into the, the, uh, the tuning, the correct calibration of the probe um, in that lab somewhat further. And as I said, problem sheet three is all to do with, with these circuits. If you want some more examples, if I didn't give you enough work to do, I think I probably did, but if, then there is an excellent book by Norman and Tor called Pulse and Digital <coughs> Circuits. Now, it's very old. There are no colour pictures, and the cover does not have shiny things on the front. On the other hand, it is extremely cheap. 
If you want a nice new book, then that's okay. You can try any of the ones that I give out in lecture one. If you want some extra examples, then you can dig this out of the library. I'm sure it's there. And I don't suppose more than one of you will actually want it, right? So this is my, my pulse survey example. So actually, I have added one resistor and one diode. And I'm going to do it using superposition, probably. I am. But I can assume a few things. When you were doing the previous problem sheet, assuming you've all done it, right? <laughs> assuming you've not started it, I mean. Um, for the last couple of lectures, I've been standing up saying, oh, there's 0.7 volts across the diode. Yes? If you remember, Ohm's law, you remember 0.7 volts across the junction, you will become an engineer eventually. More or less. For this sort of circuit, where we have to deal with pulses, worrying about the 0.7 is deeply inconvenient. And actually, if our pulse amplitude, that's to say the height, Oh dear, my laser point is giving up the ghost. There we go. If it's much, much bigger than 0.7, the 0.7 is fairly small by comparison. And if we ignore it, it won't make such a big deal with our answers. If we want to go back later and check it to make sure it doesn't make a big difference, we can. So we can solve it using a simple assumption first, is that the diode has zero volts across it. Now, of course, you may say, well, if the diode's got zero volts across it, it doesn't dissipate any power. This is quite unrealistic. Yes, that's true, it is quite unrealistic, but it makes things much simpler. There I say, trust me. The other thing we can say is that the diode has no series resistance. So this is my simplest possible model of the diode. And the other thing we'll say is that the capacitor is initially discharged, which means there's no voltage across it because there's no charge on its plates, which means there's no electric field inside it. Unless, of course, the question says otherwise, but it very rarely does. So there will be an input, and the input will be given in the question, or another engineer will give it to you, maybe, I don't know. We will say a single 0 to 10 volt pulse of 5 seconds duration. Now let's imagine I didn't give the graph. You must be able to plot the graph, otherwise you won't be able to answer the question, because the question almost certainly says, sketch the graph. So, this is what we're doing. This is the input to our circuit. If you are unhappy with how I arrived at this, get me in the tutorial and I'll sit down with you and explain it. Sorry, not tutorial, problem class. So, can we describe the operation in words? Maybe I will give uh, two or three marks, which runs along the lines of, explain what's happening, rather than just derive some maths. So there are two regions we're interested in. There's after we start the pulse, but before the pulse ends, and then there is after the pulse ends, what happens then. So just after t equals zero, t equals zero being the time when this, this edge here happens. So just to the, the right of this, this point, the diode becomes four biased because the voltages are such that they will drop 0.7. If you don't like that, draw out the circuit diagram and prove it to yourself quite quickly. It's the previous problem sheet is dealing with that sort of thing. So C1 must get charged up by V in through R2. What do I mean by that? Well, that means D1 becomes four biased and a voltage VI is dropped across R2, charging C1 and passing a current through R1 as well. So a current flows in, in this loop here. And this causes V out to rise exponentially towards a maximum, or the aiming voltage. And the capacitor current is initially a maximum. So because there is no voltage across the capacitor in the beginning, and the resistor R2 and the capacitor in parallel, there can be no voltage across either of them initially. Consequently, the current that flows on the edge of the pulse, the first, the rising edge of the pulse, must be the biggest one. And after that, it will get smaller. Some of the current in R2 flows in R1, and that complicates the problem. It changes how the circuit reacts. It doesn't change the shapes, and it doesn't change the time constant. But it does change the actual numerical answers. So 
That's all happening in this region here. You now I lost my laser pointer recently. This one belongs to Gavin Williams. And I happen to know he's lecturing at 11 o'clock. So if it's not working for me, maybe I'll run down and get him a new battery. So after five seconds has passed, the pulse ends, and V in is back to zero. So we are on this edge here. In fact, we are at this point, looking that way. So V in is now switched off, essentially. It's got zero volts across. It's not playing any part in the circuit. I can replace it with its internal resistance if I want to. So the capacitor is now charged up and it's the source of all the energy. And that energy is going to be turned into electrical potential. So electric field stored in the or electrical energy stored in the capacitor is going to be turned into heat in the resistor R2 and then that's going to slightly warm up the room. But not appreciably. The diode is reverse biased. It's reverse biased when the current stops. The current IC1 charging up the capacitor current in this loop here, when that current ceases, the diode will stop being in conduction. It will become reverse biased. It doesn't matter about the voltage across it. Only the current determines whether it's conducting or not. So current will then, in this second part, leave the capacitor and flow in R1 in a loop like this. And because this diode is reverse biased, it will conduct no current. As a consequence, there is no current flowing in a loop like this. And this business here, essentially is taken out of the circuit completely. And we are just left with the capacitor, which is charged up, discharging through the resistor. So C1 discharges through R1 only, and because R1 is larger than the parallel combination of R2 and R1, we should expect C1 to take longer to discharge. The resistance is bigger, so if you prefer, then the pipe is thinner that we pour the water through. Pretty much. If you're really, really awake, you might be wondering why I've got R2 and R1 in parallel, but we will come to it. So what does this look like on the graph? Well, on the graph, can you see the green, by the way? Okay, and can you differentiate it from the red? Okay, good. If not, I could probably make it slightly darker in here. So the green is the voltage of the output, and the red is the capacitor current. So we have exponential rise to a maximum, and the current is biggest here. It just so happens that they overlap. There's no significance in the fact that they're next to each other. If I scaled the graph differently, they would not be. Remember that the red is a current, and I measure it off my right axis, and the green and the blue are both voltages measured off the left. So my shape for the rising exponential to a maximum is my aiming voltage, which is that less, or that less that rather. 1 minus e to the minus t on this axis, and tau 1 is my first time constant. Because the diode changing state, conducting to non-conducting, changes my circuit. And I have two circuits, each having its own time constant. That's where the difference lies between the diode RC problems in 118 and the RC problems you'll get in 117. So the current falls more or less to zero as the capacitor is charged up, and when the capacitor reaches that aiming voltage, there isn't any current flowing. So you might be thinking, well, why doesn't this get all the way up to the top? If I go back and look at the circuit diagram, imagine the capacitor is charged up. Well, if you don't like the idea of that, imagine the capacitor is not there at all. What's going to be my voltage across the L? No capacitor, diode conducting. All the murmurings. What was the question? The question was, imagine the diode is conducting and drops no voltage, so draw a straight line. Take away the capacitor, what is the voltage V out? Now, you can't give me a numerical answer because I didn't tell you about this. Sorry, go. Zero. Zero? Zero? No, that's not zero, I'm afraid. Although it's a worthy attempt. Is it a potential divider? Yes. Of course, I must debate. 
V R one plus R one over R two. Yeah. Yes. Just in case, correct. Well done. I owe you a biscuit or something. Um, v in times R one over R two plus R one. V in is shared out between this resistor and this resistor in proportion to their values. So this one gets more and this one gets less. And it turns out that 20 over 25 is the same as um, 8 over 10. So the fact that this one can never, this one can never get all of V in because some of it will always be left across, across R2. So the aiming voltage is actually 8, not 10. So A1 is 8 volts, A1 is my aiming voltage. And the peak current is 2 milliamps. I got to 2 milliamps by uh, dealing with V is 10 volts, R2 is 5k, and initially this is discharged, therefore 0 volts here. So I've got 10 volts across 5k yields the 2 milliamps. Just in case you're starting to lose faith, this is hands down the hardest bit of this course. It's the bit that everybody tries to avoid in the exam. Right. So there is now another, another period of time here where we have to reanalyze the circuit, knowing that the diode switched off. So everything on this slide is the description I've just given. There is no point in me reading it to you because it won't go in any better than it did just now. The only way you can get a handle on this is to sit down and work through it and follow these pointers. So we're on to our next bit. We have a new circuit. It's the same physical thing. I don't have two circuits on my desk, I have one, but the diode changes state. So now I have IC has changed direction because the, the capacitor is now discharging before I current went into the capacitor. Down the page, when the capacitor is discharging to the resistor, the current will flow like that, out of the capacitor through the resistor. So it's changed direction. So on the graph, we end up with a minus sign, so it's below the line. And we have exponential decay to zero on both of them. The fact that this one's upside down is dealing with all that. It only means the current direction change. So my peak current is V out over R1 because I have VR volts across my capacitor when it's charged up, which is at the end of the pulse, and that is dropped all across R1, so the current here is whatever VR is maximum across the 20K. It just on the board. So tau 2 is larger than tau 1 because 20K is larger than the parallel of 20 and 5, and the negative peak current you get from Ohm's law and it's is it really that bad? I think it is, yes. Wrong. If you look on the next slide, there's an error here. This number is actually 7.99 something, something, something. I missed that. Somebody please drop me an email, even now, to say, E118, lecture 5, slide 12, bottom line. Otherwise, I won't do it. So at the end of the pulse, T is just past 5 seconds. V out reached approximately 80 volts. In fact, if I run the numbers, 7.9999. I think the next one is a minus one, actually. And the current has fallen almost to zero. It's basically nothing, like just under 10 nanometers. So V1 falls to zero, that's the input voltage, goes away, and IR2 falls to zero, the diode switches off. Another one, right. Slide 13, that should be an I. The I. I R2 falls to zero, the diode switches off, and the circuit just becomes C1 and R1 in parallel, which is a reasonably trivial case. C1 is the source of energy, and the energy is lost as heat in the resistor until C1 discharges to zero, and then the circuit is in a state of quiescence or it's at rest. Now nothing is happening. And the time constant for the discharge is R1 times C1. Hopefully, you can see that one quite easily. The other one is a bit more worrisome. If you want some more practice of this sort of thing, you don't want to go and get Milman and Torb from the 50s. 
you can get any of the books by Smith and Dorff. Now, is Circus Devices and Systems, and the fifth edition's got a yellow orange colour with a picture of an IC on the front. But I think it's now in its seventh edition, and that's black cover maybe. There should be plenty of copies in the library. So why is Tau 1 R1 in parallel with Seymour? Well, you know how we spend a lot of time doing Thevenin <coughs> until you're really, really tired of it. And you wonder what the difference between 118 and 117 was. This is why, because it comes up everywhere and it's really important and it's great fun. Well, certainly the first two. If the diode is switched off, the diode is switched off. Not if the diode is switched off. Apologies. Let's imagine the diode has no voltage across it. It's switched on, but it drops no voltage because that's my uh, way of dealing with diodes in these sort of circuits. I say it's turned on with zero volts, not turned on with 0.7. But when we do conduction state problems, then it is turned on with 0.7 in order that it will dissipate in power to be realistic. <coughs> now let's imagine that I have switched off the eye. I'm switching it off because I'm looking this way into the circuit. If you feel like it, you can say, I will take a signal, a signal being anything that contains information, and I will drop them in a jam jar, and all the signal wants to do is get to the ground. So I open the jam jar, give my tweezers, take out the signal, put the lid on the jam jar really quickly, because otherwise they will escape, and then I drop it on the circuit, just there. And the signal's job is to get to ground, because that's all signals want to do. I'm looking this way. So a couple of you in the tutorial yesterday didn't like the way I did Thevenin. This is the other way, which is a bit quicker, but you have to think certain thoughts in a certain order, whereas the first way is just algorithm. You do certain things in a certain order, it produces the right answer, guaranteed. This is, you need to think the right thing. So I have a signal. I can't go through the capacitor because I pull that back a bit. I've got to get from here to the ground. My choice is, straight through R1, here's the ground. This is my reference or ground. Or, straight through R2, through the diode, which I short circuit because it's got the voltage across it, and through V, which I switched off. And therefore, by superposition, which I'm really happy with, I replace it with its internal impedance, which is zero. zero. So a straight line. So the, the R2 and the R1, from the signal's point of view, looking in this way, appear in parallel with each other. And the time constant they make is with C1. That's how they end up in parallel. If you don't like my signals in jam jars business, you can do your short circuit current, open circuit voltage, divide through to get R definite, and it will find that they are R to R in parallel. Right. Happy. You will be in a couple of weeks. We've got about 10 minutes to think about some other kinds of diode circuit. That's everything I have to say about pulse circuits. There is a tutorial sheet full of them, and if you are stuck with the tutorial sheet and you don't want to come to the problem class for some reason or <coughs> something else, there are the video solutions of the problem sheets on the website. And the website is on the, you know the drill. So I'm standing there doing them with explanation. The other thing I want to talk about with diode circuits is to do with what I've known for alternating current in. So this is the kind of stuff that comes out of the socket, mains. Not always as big as the mains, but that sort of thing. And this choice is guided by the fact that I have to set you an exam. Because otherwise, I must make some judgment. Well, not me personally. The exam criteria will make some judgment. And I will mark it impartially. And I can't just say I will set some circuits, because you will never ever get them. Because you need a career's worth of experience to be able to just walk up and judge anything properly. So I'm limiting it to five circuits. And they are five circuits that I chose carefully because they represent whole chunks of, not chunks, sort of areas of circuits. But they are the simplest cases for these particular areas. So they can give you quite a wide breadth of sort of experience without me assessing so much stuff that it kills you. So we will deal with these between now and Christmas. And that's pretty much all of my lectures will contain between now and then. So we have a peak detector, which you might find in an AM radio demodulator. And if you're looking at the first year construction project, 
and why wouldn't you be? Um, you might find one snuck away in there somewhere. The other one we will look at is a voltage clamp. Um, there is no reason why you ever might have come across this before. Do they still teach AM radio in A-level electronics? They got one yes and one no. Two no's. Which, which board were you with? Do you remember? OCR. OCR. I can't remember what I did A-level electronics with. It was quite a long time ago. So it may or may not have been there, but that only accounts for about three or four people. So most of you have never seen it before. That's fine. The voltage clamp we will also talk about, which is subtly a rearrangement of the peak detector, but has an entirely different purpose. Then we will combine the peak detector and the voltage clamp to make a multiplier circuit. And then we will talk mostly about rectifiers and xenobios together, and they are used mostly for making linear power supplies. So this is the uh, sort of thing you might put in a guitar amplifier to produce some DC voltages to run it, that sort of thing. Happy with that? So if you want to go and do reading in Horowitz and Hill, you know what to look up in the index. So one of the commonest applications of diodes still is the peak detector. You find it in, well, there isn't much AM radio done for commercial stuff, but there's lots of AM radio about. Um, maybe it's just not as visible as it used to be. The other thing that's known for a lot is making power supply circuits. But the uses are different. One is high current, one is low current, and we tend to, to make them a bit differently. But we need to say something about the world's power supply in order to talk sensibly about um, <coughs> the peak detector. So this is a map, which I stole and didn't reference. Um, blue is 240 or 220, 240, 50 hertz. Red is 110, 115, 60 hertz. Yellow is 115, 50 hertz and green is 220, 60 hertz. But mostly we can divide the world into red and blue. Um, the only ones that are different are Brazil and Japan. Brazil has many, many situations, but their power supply is quite islanded because there's an enormous forest in the middle, which doesn't have a very good power supply. Well, it doesn't have a very consistent power supply. I'm sure there's nothing wrong with the power, it tastes fine. Japan, on the other hand, Japan now, some countries sold electricity, in quotes, to Japan en masse. And some people started at the top, and others started at the bottom. And the ones that started in one place started on 60 hertz. And the people that started at the other end started on 50 hertz. And then eventually they met in the middle. And this is a complete catastrophe. So if you ever go to Japan, and why wouldn't you, except for the cost of the flight and so forth, go, never mind Tokyo or any of that stuff, Go into the middle of Japan, go and find a big power station where they turn 50 hertz into 60 hertz. The enormous vacuum tubes. If you can't actually go there, or well, you never get a chance, um, you'll find it in Google Images. Massive power stations just for transforming the energy between the two types. Unbelievably inefficient. So if you buy a kettle in North Japan, it'll have a plug that won't fit in Tokyo. Curious place. Like one day they'll, they'll deal with it. It's getting better now. You can get switch mode power supply and everything. So if you've been Europe and you take a laptop, you can just plug it in as long as the adapter fits. You don't have to worry about a different power supply. Are you familiar with that? No oh, way. I don't know. When, you, when they start sending you places where you've got a job, you will be very pleased that you have switch mode power supply for your laptop because you don't have to convert types. So it's not quite as bad as it used to be. But curious trivia. On with the peak detector itself, so we've got a circuit involving a capacitor, a resistor, and a diode. It's becoming a bit of a theme with me. The key elements are a source, which I'm calling V1, and a diode V1 and the capacitor. <coughs> and these are all in series because they form a loop. And it's often the case that you'll find a resistor tacked on in parallel with the capacitor in order that the capacitor should be slightly <coughs> discharged. And the reason is, uh, as a function of time, the reason is otherwise the the V1 charges C1 through D1, and then it's charged, and then we all just stop because there is nothing more to say. But actually, R1 discharges C1 with time, and V1 has to replenish C1, and R1 discharges. So there is energy flowing in and out of the capacitor in a cyclic way because we have the 50 hertz going up and down and up and down. This, this is the charging and discharging. So there are two situations. The diode conducts, which is why I'm showing on this slide, 
and the diode does not conduct, which I will show shortly. So in the conducting state, we have this voltage is positive enough that D1 is conducting, so it must be bigger than C1, plus whatever we have, so 0 0.7, and the diode, uh, there is current in the diode which flows into the capacitor and charges it. There is also a current that flows through R1 into the ground. The other situation, so in this situation, we would replace the diode with a 0.7 volt voltage source, and we would solve it as if we were solving a conduction state problem, and not worry too much about the fact that this is sinusoidal. So C1 voltage cannot exceed V1 less 0.7 because these around the loop must add up. Happy? In the other situation, which is shown here, well, this is too small, so we're in the, the lower part now, this bit. C1 has a bigger voltage than V1, D1 is reversed by us. Charge leaves, flows to R1 like this, and that bit does nothing at all. So there's a loop here with the current flow that way around. And you can see that in, in that one there. This happens over and over. First one, then the other, then the first, then the second. 50 times a second. Or 60 times a second if you're in the US, or one or the other if you're in Japan. What does it actually look like? Well, I've got V out in black, I've got V in, in blue, and I've got the capacitive current in red. And this circuit's been switched on for a long time. And by a long time, I mean <coughs> half a second or so. But in terms of the number of cycles that have passed, that is a long time, because 25 cycles have already occurred. <coughs> so the resistor is discharging the gas, and that causes this slight drop here. And if I let this go long enough, the drop would eventually turn into an exponential, and we'd be back in cold circuits territory. Now you see why I lectured in the order I do. When the diode turns on just here, it's because V in has just exceeded the voltage on the capacitor, which is black, plus the 0.7. But the scale is such that the 0.7 doesn't look very large, which is sometimes why we can neglect it. When it turns on, the capacitor is recharged quickly because the diode offers very little resistance, and the power supply replenishes the capacitor almost immediately, and a big current flows to make that happen. As the capacitor reaches the, uh, or well, as V in, reaches its highest point and the capacity sort of catches up essentially, voltage on it, then the voltage difference which drives that current is falling and eventually it comes to zero. And then the diode switches off. So when the red line crosses the zero, that's diode switch off. We have this region here. This region here is the resistor discharging and the capacitor is losing charge. That's why the current flowing out of the capacitor is shown below the zero on this axis, because the current's going the other way. Now, if I integrate current with time, what should I get? We'll see if you understand your power networks now. Charge. Well done, sir, for charge, and also you as well. You get Q is I times T, so I'm gonna get charge. Now, if this circuit's been running for a long time, even though its voltage and current are changing, I would call it in steady state because the same thing happens over and over and over. So the state is steady. Overall, nothing's changing. If that's the case, the area under here is the charge replenished in the capacitor per cycle. And the area under here is the charge leaving the capacitor per cycle. And if we're in steady state, those areas must be equal to each other. Happy with the idea? Not too happy. Right, that's all I've got to say for today, which is nearly on time. So we talked a bit about pulse circuits, and we said that in 118 we worried about how to deal with the circuit, not how to derive the exponential. And then we developed the idea of a time constant for a bit, and we talked about a low-pass filter, although I never actually said the words, it is, in terms of it being driven by a square wave pulse. And I worked through an exam strength pulse circuits question. If you want another one of similar strength, then go in the 2015 exam, question one part B, through to D. And you can find the solution for the exam on the web as well, I think. 
And then I started the introduction of five diode circuits, which are driven by sinusoids, or sine waves. And they are the basis of what we will discuss between now and the end of Christmas. And we started talking a bit about the peak detector in terms of its operation as a function of time, and we'll carry on with that in the next lecture. Right. There's my name.